Good evening. Good evening, Jim. Good evening, Hi. Andrew. How are you doing? Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much for, for joining on a Monday evening. And anyone who's watching, uh, you're most welcome. Um, we're going to be looking at springtime foraging this evening. So um, I think it's perfect timing, just getting into spring. And uh, I was even out today, and we're going to have a little look at some of the things I picked up today a little bit later. But um, yeah, just um, if you're watching us live, uh, then please let us know where you're watching from. And also, if you've got any any questions at all, uh, then um, post them up. Um, we're going to be having a chat with Jim, and um, we're going to be talking about all things foraging. And I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction for you, actually, Jim. So I know we yeah. know each other pretty well, but for those that don't. Um, so an international mountain leader uh, and also a keen conservationist and into botany as well. Uh, you've been involved with the outdoors since a young age. And in 2008, uh, you achieved a master's degree in conservation and land management. Um, Jim, you play an active role with the Ogwen Valley Mountain Rescue Organization, which you joined back in 2006. And you also teach first aid. That's very impressive, by the way. That is an amazing <laughs> amazing job um jim works leading expeditions and also teaches others about natural environment through nature's work uh, which is his own company and has co-authored the alps a natural companion uh, he's led expeditions all over the world uh, east africa mongolia china borneo and uh, even down to venezuela uh, in south america so um welcome this evening jim it's really thank you really cool. si, that's quite a big it sounds very big and posh and impressive but yeah no it's uh yeah you sum well, it up like that do you know what i can i can say from personal experience jim is a fantastic guy and we're so lucky to have him chatting with us this evening this is obviously being recorded as well so if um if you're watching it back uh, a big welcome to you but if you're watching live uh, you can um, tell us where you're watching us from and also if you've got any questions at all as we go through the talk uh, this evening um, ask away find out you know this is our, our moment to have a, a chat with an expert um, but I've worked with Jim in a few different locations and I think the first time we met Jim it was on a it was on a mountainside I think it was part of when we were becoming international mountain leaders ourselves and I'll never forget I think we were a group of about 12 people and um, we walked past this plant some, somewhere in the Alps, can't remember where. And like everyone else just was walking on and you were like, over here, and everyone have a look. This is amazing, <laughs> the plant that I've just found. And, and um, I think your enthusiasm was just so contagious, um, you know, towards the natural environment. And uh, I think that's something really quite special and something that, you know, at Run the Wild, um, when we're doing our, our trips, we, we try and get, you know, a, a bit of that. And I think people love interacting with the natural world it's just unfortunate that we've forgotten a little bit about it so um so could you yeah start us off where, where did you where did your interest in plants come from jim oh um when i was young i remember um my mum showed me this little nettle like plant with little white flowers and you could suck the the sweet like sugars from it and i was always fascinated by that and we lived down by a canal and we used to walk down to school down the canal and in the autumn we'd pick blackberries and, you know, get apples from, from the wild. So, yeah, it started at a young age and my dad grew vegetables and still does. So I got parents, they were very kind of aware of the natural world and, and my mum guided me a bit when I was young. So that, was, that was my initial interest. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. And obviously we're talking about um, foraging and, um, I mean, where would... Where would you go to forage? You're, you're based because you're based up in Snowdonia. Where would you go to forage in your area? Well, it, it depends on the time of year. So you've got see, um, it's very seasonal. So you know, at the moment, start things are coming out from the winter hibernation, and the leaves are starting to pop out. And so you're looking um, the best. Well, the best places are like woodlands. The fantastic places, hedgerows are well overlooked. There's a lot of things in foraging that are overlooked. Some of the common species are very nutritious and really good for you. Um, so obviously you've got to have permission to go if you're, you know, uh, or on someone's land, you know. Um, but there's a whole host. There's there's so many habitats. It doesn't. 
it doesn't matter if you're in a an urban environment there's always an environment where you, there's something that could be um, foraged and I think that's you know you raise a good point there you know it's, it's sort of there's opportunities everywhere and I think also as well you know in, you we're talking this evening about foraging but what we're really going to focus on um, and to put everyone's minds at ease is, is really things that are like quite common that most people would see kind of on a regular basis as much you know and probably it identify in their garden and go that's a weed throw it yeah. away it's got no use whatsoever we're not looking to kind of pluck the rarest plants <laughs> uh, you know, exactly yeah, exactly this is it isn't it and i think um so and i think you know jim as well you raised an important point the rules around foraging um you know i think that's 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 really important things like permissions uh, and things like that as well. Absolutely. So really, anything else that you'd like to add to that any sort of any sort of good ground rules for anyone that's yeah going so there's, there's like an etiquette to foraging so you need by law you're not allowed to uproot a wildflower so you could take a leaf, you could take a flower, but you can't lift the whole thing with roots out of the ground. That's illegal. You need permission from the landowner, and it's all for personal consumption, not commercial harvesting. That's different. So we're talking about personal consumption here. Um, but in, in etiquette, you were saying about rare flowers, you wouldn't go and pick the rarest flower and eat it. It's often the ones that which are abundant, the ones which are very common, which that's really what we're going to focus on here. Um, and they're often overlooked, and so hopefully, well, by the end of this, we'll we'll highlight there's some you know wonderful flowers out there that everyone can identify. Absolutely, yeah, I'm really excited about this because I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to look at some different plants, and um, and also Jim is going to come up with some recipes as well. So like you know, you can really. You know, I'm. Everyone knows I'm not a great cook, but uh, for everyone else in the world, they'll be able to spice up their dishes a little bit more uh, with hopefully after this evening. Um, I'm so yeah, we could definitely have a look at that. And other places that people should should avoid, like you know, what about roadsides and things like that? Is there is there any issues around kind of pollution? Definitely, or? absolutely. You, yeah, where there's lots of fouling, your you know uh, agricultural runoff or areas of high pesticide, as you said, roadside. I mean. You, you've got to be careful where you pick. So you want the flowers to be abundant, but you also don't want them to be washed with, you know, road runoff or uh, things. So absolutely, you know, if you're concerned, rinse them. But that's a, a, one good point, actually, when you're picking leaves, you often pick the youngest, freshest leaves, like you would in the supermarket, you get the fresh, young baby spinach leaves. And you do the same with foraging, you don't take the old leaves. So the younger ones are gonna be less, polluted if you're concerned about that than the ones which have been there for for months and they're more nutritious that makes a lot of sense and mm. you said obviously foraging very seasonal is there a particular time or are there particular times of year obviously we talk about springtime that's going to be the focus for this evening but are there other yeah. times of year that you know people should be going out looking around for potential absolutely things? yeah i mean you think about the the, the natural seasons, you've got the winter, there's not really a lot growing. It's very, there's some seeds out there, but now the leaves are starting to appear. Some of the beech tree, you can take the beech leaves when they start to appear. Um, hawthorn, you can take the leaves for those young in salad, they're quite nutty. So from some of the trees, you've got the leaves appearing in the woodlands now and the hedgerows in the summer or later in the spring, you've got more flowers. And then the autumn, you've got the seeds and the berries. So different plants you would take a different part you don't always take the same part from every every plant but yeah no so there's six or seven months worth of foraging that's very interesting actually i quite like that that aspect about you know the different parts of the plant um you know i suppose as well you know we want you know it's sustainable you know leaving you know only taking what you need and like you say not destroying the plant or the or the kind of um, the habitat in the process because yeah, yeah. lots of wildlife they you know that's what they rely on um, so I think that's that's really good any sort of any sort of equipment anything that people should like be taking packing out with them nothing really I mean mate you might want to take a pair of scissors yeah and um, yeah a little bag and you know you know something just to to collect these things and maybe separate them if you're collecting different things you want to keep them separate yeah but yeah apart from that very very little. That makes sense. And I think I suppose, you know, 
we're going to quickly go into this uh, rabbit hole of like, how mm. do we identify? How do we know what it is? And I know we've we've got some we've got some picks we can have a look at in a minute. But um, do you, how how do you go about it, Jim? You know, do you take a book with you? Uh, I suppose you've got a book inside your head, really. But um, you know, that what? How would you start going about identifying? You know, um, and how should people? But I mean. Excellent point. I mean, identification is the key of all of this for safety. I mean, there's a saying you can eat every plant once. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, so you want to be super safe. And um, the flower is obvious, one of the most obvious features. When you look at a leaf, it's green. It it doesn't really resemble much. But when you, if you think about a daisy, you, everyone could imagine a daisy with the yellow centre and the white petals going around. It's really obvious, but the leaf wouldn't be. Um, then the other key thing with that is how big the plant is, but also where it's found. Is it a woodland plant? Is it, and you're looking at a book and it says only found in grasslands, and then you're in the woodland or on a sand dune. It's like not going to be that species. So the habitat is really key as well as as identifying the flower okay that makes sense i know there's sort of like certain areas that you know are like pine woods like more do they produce like more hazardous sort of things like mushrooms or plants or is there is there any sort of is there something like is there any kind of like rules of thumb other than um, like you say uh, it shouldn't be growing then and there yeah i think some fungi and some plants are associated with a certain habitat Right. So in, an, uh, in a broadleaf forest, you would get certain species in a beech forest or in a pine forest. Or, so there are associations of some flowers. So, and some habitats are naturally more diverse than others. Right. So you're going to find a greater variety of species. I you know, and that's really clear with fungi. You, know, you get pine, have certain fungi. Um, the fly agaric, the red and white mushroom, birch forest because there's an association with the roots and the fungi. So yeah, very true, you know, have certain habitats, but they're plantations, but in our wild habitats, you think grasslands, hedges and woodlands, coastline, then you've got really diverse environment. That makes sense. But there isn't like one environment where we go, you know what, let's just steer clear of that environment. It's actually just having an awareness of what grows in in the correct environment or in its appropriate environment is- Yeah, is I guess, I guess there are some species which are really deadly. Mm. So you get some uh, deadly nightshade comes right. to mind. Hemlock, hemlock grows in ditches and water environments. So, and if you're not sure what something is, then you know to steer clear of those species. Yeah. But then there's also some lovely flowers that you can get, like meadow sweet, in a in a damp ditch, and and so it, it, you know it's it's just being aware that there are some nasties out there makes sense Uh, and i think that's a really good good point isn't it there's certain things that are easier to identify certain things like you know like say the flowers or something that just stands out a lot more than a leaf um you know we talked about this the other day didn't we just briefly i think was it you know the difference between lettuce and a cabbage you know that's like really you know like everyone knows the difference between lettuce and cabbage but if for the person that walked up and never seen the two uh, before, looking at them both, they'd be like, "It's the same thing, right?" But exactly, exactly. Yeah. But it's like um, it's like a character. Each each plant has got its own. There's something really obvious about it. So, um, you know, there's a there's a um, when you're a little kid and you you've got this sticky grass and you can pick a sticky grass and throw it on your mate's back. And it's like, there's only one plant that does that, that looks like that. So it's really easy to distinguish that from something something else. So there's a, there is, each one has a character. It's just, sadly, you've got to go through the process of learning what the character is yes. to then be, be good at ID. So it takes time. It takes time. Well, let's, I, I know you've, you've shared with me some slides. So should we, should we dig into what we can use plants for? I think that's a yeah. good is that a good point? Sure. We get this to uh, work out here. So uh, I'm just going to add to this. And Jim, you're going to just have to sh- so basically shout at me when you want me to move through the slides. Uh, okay. And I'll, and I'll make that happen. So uh, I Ooh, think you- there we go. I think the, the, the thing, apart from a nice glass of red wine, 
<laughs> key things about plants plants are used for nutrition but they also have a function for therapy so we talk about medicinal plants and there's within plants there are lots of active compounds and the active compounds um are in different classes and groups so for instance the thing in red wine that makes your mouth um you get that sour or that that drying um effect on the mouth or even the headache in the morning is due to a plant compound and it's a tannin and tannins are really common in many many leaves and berries and its main function in the wild is to um act as an insect repellent stop insects eating the leaf or the plant so they have a natural function but they're found everywhere but it's the effect on the body has that it's uh, like an astringent effect but so that's why there's an image there so we can relate it to things that we drink or or eat and consume but there's it's the the group of plant compounds that is behind maybe what something makes it therapeutic or medicinal or or nutritious makes sense that makes sense should we go to the next one yeah. go for it oh now the uh, coffee i love coffee caffeine oh, is is <laughs> is uh, a, one of, a member of a group of very, very powerful, strong, almost some of these alkaloids are so pronounced in their effect on the human body that we consider them poisons. Caffeine isn't one, but anything that ending in INE is generally, not always, but necessarily uh, an, an alkaloid. Now, there's lots of different groups of alkaloids, but anything like... Caffeine, uh, atropine, if you've heard of that, strychnine, nicotine, all these things ending in in cocaine, in fact, they all have these active compounds, alkaloids, very pronounced effect, as we know about caffeine, for its stimulant effect. So plants generally with alkaloids, you generally steer clear, but they are used medicinally, but some of them are recreational, like coffee, which I love. Mm. Yes. Definitely the right way to start the day. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Here we go. Another one for you. There's another one that's a, a flower from the Alps. Um, a bitter. Um, bitters are, are great at stimulating digestion. So you might often have a, an aperitif after a, a meal, and it just stimulates bile production, the stomach juices, saliva. So those compounds are known as bitters. And some, the root of the yellow gentian, has been used for thousands of years to stimulate, um, yeah, uh, you know, digestion. And, and, and so, so we've got a long use of some of these plants through historical use. Um, but yeah, the effect is really pronounced. And some groups of flowers have lots of bitters. Some groups of flowers have lots of alkaloids. And so some, like the rose family, is a quite good one so if you were to have a strawberry or an apple anything like that or the rowan and have a berry yeah. then those the the rose family are okay but you wouldn't go and pick something from the buttercup family because there's lots of alkaloids in the buttercup family. right and so you some families have these more of these active compounds than the others so in some ways you can you could group them well i would pick something from that family or not that one so yeah, there, there is a, not always, but it's, there is some commonality between species within a family of plants. Right. So, so kind of basically some, some families are a little norm, tend to be more edible, tend to be safer, yeah. have that characteristic. Whereas another one might be more towards not being so good for you, a bit more hazardous exactly. or different properties. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, the daisy family is okay. Um, and as I just said, the rose family is a great one. We have a lot of fruits, cherries, plums, you know, hawthorns, even the rowan tree, you know, lots of big trees as woody trees, as well as little strawberries, you know, they're all in the rose family. So they're, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I've got another one for you here. Yeah. So that's thyme and thyme contains a, a compound called a phenol and so these the kind of aromatic nature you get there are you know and if you think about the mint family full of aroma 
Mm. And so we have men menthol, you know, um, peppermint, you know, mint tea is a great stimulant. So if some of these have quite pronounced effect on the body, going back to an alkaloid, there's one, if you've ever had vervain or valerian tea, uh, yeah, valerian, yes. It's, it's, it contains a natural sedative. So you have it at night if you can't sleep. And it's the root of that plant. And you see it, the red valerian, it's in, introduced to Britain, but you find it living in walls and, and places. But it's fairly abundant around the country now, but it's the root and it's an active compound. And the part of the plant is the root, whereas the you can smell the aroma from, from the thyme, from the, from the flowers. So different parts of the plant can be used and uh, herbalists would take the extract maybe or they'll take the leaf so yeah different it's not a one rule no one. that makes sense and actually the valeria i remember i remember seeing that because uh, you know i did did some mental health first aid uh, course um wow. during lockdown as you do yeah. and um because uh, yeah it's going to be an issue uh, and yeah i think valerian root that's still used isn't it as a like a either an antidepressant or certainly to help people with anxiety issues and things like that so like that's right you know, it's a sedative it's, yeah, it's a natural sedative but again it's it's like all these things it's got a use hmm. and when if you were to buy it from a shop or a pharmacy it's got a controlled concentration yeah. and constantly in the wild. Thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Everything in moderation is the key with everything. Even you pick wild garlic, you don't want to be eating it day in, day out. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's just, it's something to add into things rather than. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's very sensible. Yeah. It's not all about, yeah. It's quantity is a, is a big important part of it. Definitely. Yeah. Should we uh, head to the next? We've got another slide here for yeah, you. Yeah, so there, that's a foxglove, a classic. It's very active compound, the glycoside. And this is a cardiac glycoside, which has a very pronounced effect on the heart. And it's been used for 250 years through medicine to slow the heart rate down, um, just so that, you know, surgeons can work on a heart which isn't beating constantly. So... Glycosides are really active, but we know of foxglove as being deadly. Mm. And again, it's because the concentrations, they know exactly what's to use. But they're active compounds. And as I said, some are very pronounced. And peppermint is, is a great stimulant, as is uh, coffee and caffeine. So, yeah, it's just to demonstrate that it's the active compound which acts as the therapeutic value if you were using it for medicine, say. That makes a lot of sense. I think we've got... One more. And then garlic, flavonoids. Flavonoids are a type of glycoside, but they're really common and abundant. And, you know, garlic's full of them. So lots of fresh fruit, uh, fresh veg anyway, you, you'll get flavonoids. And uh, so, you know, and the, the list carries on and on. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I it's just to give an idea. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think that gives, I think that gives people a really good idea of kind of the, the sort of the groupings of, things that we're looking at this evening um obviously like yeah i was out with a group on a weekend yeah. and on our on our springtime uh 10k uh i don't know whether anyone's watching who was on that as well it was pretty much a mud fest for around about mm. 30, 30 to 40 oh, no. <laughs> uh, but there were signs of spring despite that and um, we did get a bit of sunshine as well but um you know we saw some obviously we saw some dogs mercury coming back up Sort of through the woods as well so uh you know the little green plant obviously you know this but um and you've got uh, damp woods then haven't you you've, you've got you muddy and it's it's wet so you've got dogs mercury is a wet woodland plant see this 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 is this is why it's so good to have jim on the phone that's the <laughs> thing because you can you know somebody who knows you could tell them what's there if, even if you've managed to identify it and they'll give you the environment that grows it and vice versa yeah. just I love the way the whole thing just interconnects so well. And you're probably then going to be able to tell me, El, you know, what else is growing in that area. Well, <laughs> well you'll get, well, we, yeah, we talked about wild garlic, and that's the sort of thing you'll find in that environment as well. Well, as it so happens, <laughs> I think, <laughs> now I think this, so I don't know if anyone, let me, let me, uh, okay, we'll zoom in a little bit more. So I was out, because um, we headed back, and it's amazing. Do you know, I didn't, 
just in the last few days, um, I don't know if anyone can see these, uh, but I picked these um, just about an hour ago, actually, um, on the dog walk. And as mm. um, so they're single, single leaves. So, yeah. And, uh, and then... do you want me to show you a little bit more? Go around? for it. So, uh, I don't if that is that enough information for you? Absolutely. The, the, the thing, I'll ask you to crush it in your fingers. Okay. and smell it that would be with wild garlic if you're not sure about it to have an oniony very garlic oniony, actually very yeah. oniony with a, a tinge of gar uh, garlic in there mm. yeah so that's that's your giveaway for that plant Oof. and also the leaf the shape of the leaf is like a long thin leaf but the thing with the onion family you have the veins in the leaves are parallel instead of branching out to the side so it, does it have parallel veins in the leaf and does it smell like garlic? Uh, do you know, I'm going to try and hold it up. There we go. Does that? Uh, yeah, I can see them. Yeah. 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 I think so you've got a central rib, but unlike a, an oak leaf where the branch, the veins pop out from that central rib in wild garlic, they go parallel up. Oh, I had not noticed that before. That's really good. Do you know what? The scent is really mm. strong. Uh, I know that doesn't come across, <laughs> but it, but uh, yeah, it's and it's one of those smells like once you smell it, you know, you know that's that's yeah, kind of absolutely. And the great thing is, where you find it growing, you find a lot of it. Do you know, I might be able to share a picture? If I did this right, of where we saw it. Let's. Uh, I'm gonna see and while you find know. that, I'll just say that when you see the, the white flowers of it, the leaves start to die back. Right. So the end of May, you'll start seeing the flowers, the leaves, they're old and they start to wither and die back. So you really got, that's a really good plant for now because the next six weeks or so, you've got some really good um, foraging with wild so, garlic. And so it's before it, it flowers, here we go, Let's see if we can, I don't know whether that whether everyone can see that. So that's uh, yeah. that was where we picked it. Um, yeah, like I said, about an hour and a bit ago. Yeah. So with the Chilterns there in the background. Yeah. There we go. Oh, superb! There's loads, and it's just yeah, it's it's great. It grows like a weed, but it's uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's always very exciting as well. I think finding things that you can you know add. I think current. Karen is my wife. She runs all the logistics and the and the guiding team for Run the Wild, but she's also um, a fanatical sandalwood maker. So I think uh, she's got her eye on uh, garlic uh, for some wild garlic infused sourdough. So that'll be quite nice. But wow. I think you know it was prolific. It was everywhere. So you know, just yeah. taking a handful of leaves felt yeah. felt absolutely fine. And putting it in a salad, you can cook with it. You can just have it. You can eat it raw as well. So some of these you have to cook, but you can have that raw. It's, it's where you would use garlic or onion, and you right. just substitute that. So you're making a stir fry. You put a few leaves of that in, and it, you know you can make the classic would be to make um, like a pesto, right? And you can make pesto with almonds, almonds oil, a bit of cheese, and uh, some leaves of the wild garlic or ramson. So you know it's, it's a substitute. I think that's and do you know should we should we show some of the I think you've got some plants that you've chosen uh, for for those sort of recipes. Should I add those in? Yeah. Do a little look at those. Yeah. Why not? Here we go. Here's another that looks like a So pesto. this is a right. So this is another plant that's coming up at the moment. And again the, you'll start to see the flowers at some point. But it's very it's an obvious plant jack by the hedge. And an old another name for it is garlic mustard so again if you smell the leaf and it's got a a garlicky or a mustardy kind of smell to it um it's almost like a nettle leaf when you're looking at it but they're bigger than the nettles um but you know if you're not sure about identifying there's some really good resources online and one that i use and i still use it actually just to to confirm some of the species that I've been looking at in the Alps, say, um, is iNaturalist. Okay. And you'll submit your observation with a geolocation, and it will offer up a suggestion of what it might be, 
but then other people will confirm it. And if you look at their credentials, there might be ecologists and they've got, so, you know, so you know the quality of the, the identifier as That's well. Awesome. So it's not going to be instant, but then some of these apps which can identify a plant don't always get it right. Right. So it's not about the speed, it's about accuracy. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really good point. You know, people, you know, should stay within their, you know, realms of confidence. Now, like for me, this is such a great plant to spot. And you know, and if you once you've seen it and you've smelt it, it was like, you know, that mm. lettuce cabbage thing, isn't it? It's sort of it's kind of almost yeah. quite hard to mistake it for some Absolutely. other thing once you've once you've got it in your head and you know the time of year, like you said, sort of about now. And um, I think particularly plants that have that quite a pungent smell, once you sort of, like you say, crush them between your fingers and stuff, it sort of really adds to that confirmation that, yeah, this is sort of what I was expecting. Because smells are really kind of powerful memory inducer, isn't it? I don't know if anyone's ever, you know, sort of if it smells something you hadn't smelt since you were a kid. It, it just takes you straight back there. And I think this is it's quite a good way of, I think, yeah. you know, helping the memory, I find. The great thing about uh, Jet by Hedge as well, you can substitute it for wild garlic. Right. So it's a, it's a slightly different one. Um, you don't want to have too, too much of these things, again, as I was saying earlier, because, you know, they are they do contain these active compounds, which give them the character, which we like, the, the taste and things. But very common, damp hedgerows, and there's hedgerows everywhere. If you probably, you might all have one within... 100 or 200 meters of your house you know yeah. literally it's that common and i think that's the thing you know people will just see that as a weed and they won't even see any yeah. sadly not even really see any beauty in it or anything like that but it's certainly not any any aspect that's protected about that um should we go to another another one? you think you mentioned this a little bit earlier actually. that's the yeah that's the sticky the sticky willy or the cleavers or the goose grass it's got lots of names and something which has got lots of names because it's many uses or very common and there's dozens of names for plants like this and it's characteristic Got it stuck on at some point. exactly and i mean it's one of those plants that i i remember doing as a kid anyway um flicking it on on the back of it's got these little hooks so it's really if you were to rub your hand on it it's quite rough it's got these little hooks other things that you spot from that is that it's got a square stem mm -hmm. and then it's got these rings of leaves these long narrow leaves that appear in like a ring which is unusual because a lot of flowers have pairs of leaves that pop out this has got like a ring of them and they grow quite tall and again they're, they're weedy so they'll just sprawl over any plants or hedges um but it's got a really uh a, a great use and the juice from it is meant to help. It's a tonic for the lymph system. So mm -hmm. it's a good cleanser for your lymphatic system and circulatory system. Um, I just made a, a, a carafe of water and left it to be infused. If you crush them, you're going to get more of it out. Um, you could blend it and add it to, say, apple juice. And then you've just got a little bit of a tonic with a, a drink. And you won't, you won't taste it, but it, it'll have... The juice and the concentrate in it so yeah there's lots of ways of of just utilizing it but um yeah but have it before the seeds appear so when the seeds have appeared it loses a lot of its uh effectiveness i, I think i would say yeah i like that again one of those plants that like if anyone has a garden you've probably pulled this out at some point and gone like, Definitely. I don't like growing in my garden. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's, that's so, that's so cool. That's really, really cool. Let's go to the next, uh, next slide. And guys, if anyone who's watching, obviously, um, if you've got any questions, um, then do pop them up. I think this is something obviously we've, we've just looked at and talked about as well. That's, this has now got the flowers. Yeah. Right? That's in the Lake District. Look at that, that carpet Beautiful. of, of in a beech wood. I think it's a beech wood in that, but um, yeah, it's just, it's amazing it's wonderful but, uh, really nice yeah. plant. um here we go i think most people have the bitey plant the nettle that's right i mean they love they love nitrates so they're always found around farm buildings around the back of old buildings where you know humans you know they they exist with us you know um 
so okay, abundant. It's a sign, isn't it? A sign of human human behavior. If you come across some nettles randomly, that's the indicator, yeah. isn't it? That disturbed ground and increased nutrients in the soil. So, right. yeah, we and poo and you know, spe- you know, around cows and and humans, you know, around the back of buildings. So, yeah, it's very much a weed, but a superfood. It's got. It's full of essential elements. Um, nutrients and mag- magnesium just the number of, of uh, minerals it's got in it is incredible so it is a superfood really um it's good for the blood it's good for cleansing the blood it's a tonic um for the circulatory system uh yeah ah yeah it's just i could keep going on and you've got these you can have it raw, but you've obviously got the stings, and the stings are everywhere over the plant. So the way you get rid of the sting, the best way is to boil it, and that denatures the sting. So you've got to be super careful with it. So you're saying about what you need to take with you. I would take a glove if you're going to go and harvest a, a glove and a pair of scissors, and you cut them. Um, Do but, people um, actually eat them raw? Then is that? Is that a thing? Well, that yeah, I, you, I do that with kids sometimes. I take them and I show them how to, <laughs> you know, when you grasp the nettle, the saying, you know. Um, so there's a way you can hold a nettle without getting stung. Right. So oh, always draw your hand up that. the stem. Okay. Um, but you could take the top pairs of leaves, just pinch them off, pop them in boiling water, and you've got a lovely tea. Mm. So again, it's a young, fresh leaf. So I wouldn't pick the old ones at the bottom. The ones higher up are going to be less polluted as well. So they're fresher and more nutritious when they're younger. So I just take the top two, three pairs of leaves, put them in a bag, and I'd harvest a few like that. Long season. Right. And Sophie's just Sophie's just mentioned that um, her dad uh, once made net, met nettle wine. So uh, there we go. So yeah, two glasses, one there, a healthy. And I made a I've made a, a nettle tonic actually with the with wine. And uh, apricots, uh, dried apricots, and orange, and a load of nettles, and left them in the red wine for like six weeks, and then decanted it. And then I just have that like a little shop. I remember doing that five or six years ago, and just having a little shop every now and again. And that was a blood iron tonic. So yeah, no nettle tea and stuff is good for yeah. And what's the sort of what's the sort of flavour of nettle? What, what is, can you describe it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the ni- it's not the nicest <laughs> it's quite strong <laughs> but yeah it's irony is it irony? right okay i don't know it's really hard to describe but you can smell it. it it tastes like it smells i had a friend uh growing up when i was a kid and i remember him saying that his mum gave him nettle soup and he's and i said what did it taste like and he said it it tasted like toffee and I'm like, I wasn't oh, convinced. And I think it was because his mum had told him, like, this tastes like toffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the only way that he would eat it. Uh, so I, I still have it. I'm going to have to try it. I might not try it. Yeah. Before, but I will um, definitely try it. Okay, that's awesome. We've got a couple more, I think, to look at. Oh, here we go. There's a yarrow. Yarrow. Yarrow is one of these. It's a panacea for so many things. Again, it's been used for millennia. Um, so it's got various names, yarrow. Uh, milfoil in French. It's well, its Latin name, Achillea, um, is related to a use from Achilles. So he would treat his wounded soldiers with this and it would stop the bleeding. So, an old word for it is nosebleed or, or staunch work because it would it, it stops hemorrhage. So, it's got a, a, a use that you can have externally flowers, leaves. You can see it hanging there. You can make it into a cup of tea or an infusion or a tisan. Um, so it, it's got many uses. You can have, it's an aromatic, so the leaves. Um, and the, the species name, millifolium, it's a French meal, a, a thousand leaves, basically. And it has got these tiny feather-like leaves. So it, it's it's one of the you know characteristics of it so it's aromatic it's lovely it's a great plant and it's great for tea and it's great uh, it's got many functions and you can buy it in you know tea bags if you didn't want to pick it in the wild okay that's really cool and again something quite prolific really 
Here we go. So that's, this should be, everyone should be able to identify Daisy. Let's hope so. Daisy chains in the garden. Although it's come in different sizes, some of these things. So maybe. Well, you know, the day's eye, that's where it comes from because they're open in the morning and they pop open with the day and they follow the sun round. Um, but yeah, it, you, people listening may have um, got a tube of Arnica cream and for bruising. Daisies do exactly the same thing as effectively as Arnica for bruising. And yet they're wild and they're abundant. And all you'd need to do is pick a handful of the flowers, put them in a, a muslin or something and just, just dip them in boiling water for three seconds. And then you, you put them in oil and I've got there with beeswax as well. And I've just made um, a liniment basically. And then you'd use that. That was cooling that liniment, this, the liquid. But the idea is that you then rub it on a bruise and it helps, helps with the healing process. But you, you leave, once you bruise the, the flowers by boiling water, you put them in the oil and you leave them in the oil for two weeks. So it gets all the goodness out of them. And then you use that, you, you strain them out and then you put it with the beeswax to help it set. It's, that's a, and a bit cheaper than the Arnica stuff. It's free, pretty well, pretty much free. A block yeah. of beeswax, but yeah, no, and and um, but again, I, in the olden days, I think the leaves used to be put in salads or daisies, but we don't generally eat them nowadays. Um, but it's used topically or externally. Okay, uh, um, Vicky just asked, um, do dandelions do this too? So I, I think in reference. Oh, to I don't know about. I don't know if they have. So I just got to plug myself in. Um, I know. I know. Whilst Jim's plugging himself in, I know that you can obviously eat the dandelion leaves in salad, a bit like rocket. It's quite a quite a strong mustardy flavour. But that's and I actually, I think some of like some of those some of those things where you see it now are coming back into fashion, aren't they? Into restaurants and so on. Uh, but um, yeah. So what do we think about? potentially in the same effect is it similar i'm not sure i don't know um i don't know about its effect like that but then the whole thing about a dandelion the whole thing's edible so i would pick the flowers if you're going to eat the flowers in a salad pick them before they open wide have them when they're closed right pick the leaves when they're young and fresh because they get really strong flavor and i find them too strong mm. some people put a pot over a plant with a like a ceramic terracotta pot with a hole in the top mm -hmm. and it's dark and it makes the leaves grow really tall right. and they're quite they're quite pale in color but those young fresh leaves like that you can train them up in in a in the garden you know to do that and then those are much more palatable and the root you can dry the root and put it in the oven roast it up and make dandelion coffee so there's all sorts that you can do with the dandelion the name comes from the Dent de Lyon, so the leaves are like lion's teeth. And the French also call it pissenlit, which is uh, means wet, wet the bed because it has a diuretic effect. So again, you wouldn't have too much of it. But I've, I've made like a stir fry with the dandelion with the leaves. So, you know, there, there's a whole host of things. You can use them as a salad or just, you know, flash fry them and um that's great I mean, yeah. I mean rocket is so expensive nowadays you know <laughs> and um i'm sure there's lots of you know even if you don't have your own garden i'm sure there's lots of gardeners that would um happily let you in to their back garden and uh take out some of the dandelions that are spread throughout their lawn so you know absolutely um, yeah. yeah completely yeah um and you know obviously Maybe just, you know, are there a couple of other plants that you'd like to mention at all that are really prolific that you think, you know, are worth mentioning? I know we haven't got a huge amount of time this evening, but is there anything else that we should add in? At um, what would I say? We've, oh, we've got loads of primroses. Primroses used to be really, yeah, primroses used to be really, really abundant. Um, there's still a lot of them, but they're very edible. And I've made crystallized flowers. So just dip them in egg white dried them, dip them in egg white and sugar, and leave them, you've got this beautiful, sweet flower. Wow. 
and they're out at the moment. The primrose is the prime rose or the first rose. So it's one of the first flowers you'll see. Um, oh, it just goes on. I mean, the, really? I mean, we haven't talked about the coast and the coastal flowers and things like that, but yeah. you know, woodlands, hedgerows, um, elder will be coming out, and the flowers from the elder. Yeah, hawthorn I've mentioned. So there's so many things that we're familiar with, but you know, it's knowing that we've got that possible consumption or that culinary. Absolutely. And you know what? It's it is interesting. Like a lot of like Michelin star restaurants, you know, uh, there's like Noma and all those kind of um, mm. you know, winning restaurants globally are going much more into the foraging environment and it's it's really quite interesting to see that people are starting to try and reconnect with you know the, the original version often of what we have now grown mass in mass production yeah. non it's non-cultivated they're wild mm. forms of these things so because they're wild they're often stronger right but we've we've created like the lettuce has come and we've made it really big and leafy in the wild lettuces were never like that no. so we've had that effect and we've tempered down some of the you know compounds we made strawberries really big whilst we're... but the one that i didn't mention that's out um i don't know if you've got a photo but the wood sorrel woodlands everywhere you're talking about rocket it's a great yeah. substitute for rocket it's everywhere and it's got like three little heart-shaped leaves so it's a pattern of three in a woodland and you get banks of them and it's got a a little acidic kind of lemony appley flavor mm. great it's really nice. a rocket yeah that's really not really really nice one mm. definitely and you know um if anyone's signed up to any of our trail runs coming over these next couple of months you know we we try and spot these on our runs and um you know so do feel free to ask our guides put them on the spot and uh, see where they know all of these as well. But obviously, speed, Jim, speed botany. That's that's a great botany, concept. That's it. So we had a little bit of little bit of taste of the wild garlic on uh, on Sunday. Um, and just you know, on that, are there any any sort of obviously you've written your own book? We're going to talk about that briefly. But are there any any recipe books that you'd recommend at all, Jim? Yeah, there are. There are some classics. I've got a couple just here, so I'll show you. Um, that's super free. Richard, maybe it's ah uh, what he doesn't know and what he's not compiled and the way he puts it together, it's phenomenal. It's a it's a brilliant book. Um, another of my go to books, which I've had, I mean these are back from the eighties. Wild Food by Roger Phillips. The photos are crystal clear. He talks about ID habitat. Um, but also a bunch of recipe ideas. Um, got something ready recently for my sister, the Artisan Kitchen. So there's a whole host of books you can get now. Um, oh, yeah, I've got the, the Forager's Kitchen. I've got, <laughs> I borrowed that up a friend once. Seaweed and eat it. <laughs> so again, there's just, there's so many that you can you can pick and choose from now. A lot. And obviously, like, you know, this this evening, you know, we've we've covered off some of the springtime stuff. I'm gonna try, I haven't spoken to Jim about this yet. We're gonna try and come back and do something in the autumn as well, because obviously that's a big season as well. Hopefully, we get a chance to do that. Um, before we go on to the quick fire questions, which uh we've been doing and Jim has not heard about yet, so he doesn't know what I'm gonna <laughs> ask him, which is always a bit of a fun part of the interview. But um uh, uh sort of obviously you know plants some edible some medicinal use um you know and you've talked a bit about the daisies are there any sort of other things that you recommend sort of for medicinal use so there, you know I, I remember when we were doing our like mountain leader stuff with you know kind of lots of different plants have a history or some sort of history don't they for medicinal use yeah. so you know do 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 most edible plants have a medicinal use or um, or are they kind of like just some are medicinal and some are just for eating? Or... I think, yeah, no, I think, yeah, there's a difference. So we, yeah, so some, ed so you can take some things which are beneficial for you and some mm. are just nutritious, but right. there's a combination. So things, plants like yarrow, mm. um, or there's a, um, the there's a little plant that you get in the in the grasslands called eyebright, 
Mm. So it's used to put in your eyes and it helps to dilate your pupils. Um, and so an extract is still taken from that and you can buy it in, in drugstores and boots and places like that as a tincture for eyes. So th they do make the eyes bright. So there are, but you would never ingest it. No. But and that's been used for a, a long time. It's interesting. Its family name is Euphoria or right. Euphrasia, sorry, which comes from Euphoria. Right. So it's a plant that makes you happy or gives you gladness. Oh, wow. But there's, I think there's one, anything with the word wort has a medicinal or historical use. Okay. So there's many plants that end in wort. Some of them are edible, some of them aren't. But there's an association between the word and, and the function that it had for the body. Right. That makes sense. That's a, a good starter. There's so many words. Absolutely. No, I think yeah. that's, I think that's, I think that's really good. And you know, it is fascinating, isn't it? When you're walking around the countryside or wherever you are walking, you know, if, if we were doing this in the Alps, for example, it'd be a whole, you know, different, again, different. And what's quite fascinating is if anyone gets to go to the Alps at some point uh, with us this summer or, you know, with Jim, I know you're also doing expeditions over there as well. It's like, you almost go back in the seasons as you go further up the hills. So, mm. you know, it's quite interesting. You kind of like walk from summer back into spring <laughs> and then hit winter. You get the snow <laughs> melt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> so you can kind of see some of this progression, even sort of intra season, but just kind of. Very, very yeah, fun. very true. I mean, we were saying the other day, you know, your wild garlic are out and up in North Wales, we're good two or three weeks behind. Yeah. Amazing. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. <laughs> so we're going to go to the quick fire, quick fire round. Yes. Um, there we go. Right. So uh, number one, <laughs> have you ever eaten something poisonous? Um, I had to be asked. Yeah. Not knowingly. Not knowingly. Yeah. No, I. I don't know. I've. I've always been a bit careful and a bit cautious. That's, I think that's the right answer. You know. Yeah. Especially, so if anyone's getting led by, um, yeah, Jim, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, he's still here, right? So that's a good, yeah. that's, that's, so that's a really good, uh, really good. But I think, I think your body tells you it's poisonous before you fully take it in. So your mouth would reject it. Your lips might go, ugh, you know. There was something about broad beans I couldn't eat when I was young. It was just I couldn't eat them. So there's your body tells you, and if you just chew something on your tongue or just in your front teeth, and if it doesn't taste right, you know it's not going to be good for you. So yeah, and I think isn't it, broad beans like they're one. I mean, there's a lot of things, aren't they? If you eat a lot of them, it's not going to be good for you. And I think yeah. that's true with you know anything from pizzas to whatever. But you know, exactly. you know broad, broad <laughs> beans are one of those things. I think Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts have a natural radioactivity to them. Um, is that right? Not many, not many people know this, but I actually worked in a nuclear power station for a, for a little while in my life, and uh, and it was and I I spent some time in working with fuel movements. So everything's it's all kind of it's a very mm. safe environment you're working with, and and they they measured the time, so they worked it out your time. So maybe an hour moving around nuclear fuel is equivalent to five hours living in Cornwall. Or oh. eating this number of Brazil nuts, which is just fascinating. <laughs> People are like they're not surely no. So anyone who likes eating Brazil nuts in Cornwall, watch out. And um, they're going to check if they glow at light. Or... <laughs> no. And it's because of the granite. So I just have that. Oh. Um, uh, I was going to ask how bad did you feel. So there we go. We'll move on to question three. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favourite edible plant? Oh, that's a really good one. I mean, just. For the versatility, wild garlic oh, is great. But the first one I remember using and, you know, getting people to experiment with, with was wood sorrel. So I love it. It's just, you know, so common, so abundant. And I still use it today. It's, it's you're saying it, it's like a hook or it's a story, it's a lead in. And it's one of the easiest, best ones to bring people into it. Um, just starting to taste wild food is great, yeah. I think it's really good. And you know what, as well, like anyone who's anyone who's watching this who's quite into their trial running and maybe gets a little bit dehydrated on their runs and sort of maybe kind of just feels a little bit not quite... It, you can lose your presence a little bit when you're running a long time. And mm. you know, if you eat 
one of these herbs like some thyme or wood sorrel they're they're so pungent in the mouth they kind of they kind mm. of almost bring some kind of you back yeah. bring you back yeah. like a, almost like and you a, don't always um, need to eat them you just put them in no. your mouth and just taste them and then spit it out and, yeah completely okay so uh question four um is uh, what's the rarest plant you've seen oh the oh, rarest one <laughs> it's uh, in the east i think the rarest ones i've seen are in the eastern alps there there's a lot of endemic species in the eastern alps okay. dwarf gentian they're so small it's just trying to see them i'm just doing a re-edit a second edition of the book on the alps so i'm adding some more species to it so i've seen you know and i i, I i'm hunting things all the time really so yeah i've seen um oh, beautiful little flowers i don't know I mean, I could say the snow and lily, but it's not the rarest flower in the world because there's lots of them in the Alps. So right. it's uh, that's fair enough. No, that's that's, but but it's still pretty rare in Snowden, isn't it? I think it's kind of like oh, a, uh, yes, yeah, tell anyone where it is, kind of no, um, top yeah, secret, top secret, mm. exactly. Um, now, who inspires you the most? Is something we've asked everyone, um, and it can be anyone. Wow, um, I in terms of flowers and botany. Or in life, I think James Lovelock inspires me enormously. Okay. Um, That's a good answer. But Roger Phillips with his books and the information, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, just amazing. Good answers. Okay, next one: Bear Grylls or Ray Mears? Ray Mears knows his stuff. <laughs> he's very, <laughs> he's very, very good. Yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah, no, he's 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 done a lot of yeah yeah no he's my kind of he's more my of the two he's uh, it's a good one. who I've got to walk with. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so next one, I think I know the answer to this one. Do you use any forage plants for medicine for yourself? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say I, I use them more regularly, but I I do use them. You know, if I've got a cut. Um, yeah, I remember at Balm when I was in about 15, someone said, oh, put this comfrey ointment on your skin because it will help. It's called knit bone. So I've got some of that in the cupboard. Um, yeah, I've got arnica. I've got, you know, I've got my my uh, daisy balm as well. So I do use things yeah. more topically than I don't take, I don't chew, <laughs> I, don't, I don't chew a, a willow leaf or uh, you know bark to get the aspirin from it but I, I just get the aspirin tablets you know but i could you know it's where the aspirin came from it's from yeah. the bark of willow tree that makes sense yeah that's good that's good and last one you'll be pleased to know <laughs> uh any plant that you haven't yet seen but you really really want to like your bucket Ooh. list of, i must see this before you know Ooh. maybe there's orchids mm. there's some amazing yeah. orchids and I mean, I've studied a lot of the Alps for years and years, and I've got to know species. But there's still there's still the odd one that that's a really classic that eludes me, like an alpine. Um, it's a, a pasque flower, but a mountain pasque flower, the purple one that you get in the mountains. It says they're common. I've never seen one. <laughs> so things like that are just like why. <laughs> Yeah. Why haven't I seen anything like that? So it's as dull as that. It's something that's fairly common that I've still never seen. Some of those flowers are absolutely stunning, though. It's so beautiful. So yeah, I mean, I've seen like yeah, I mean that's that's what drew me into the Alps. Really, it's the the diversity and the colours and just yeah, it's phenomenal. What a, what a, an amazing environment! And we're both fortunate that we 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 guide in those environments. Absolutely. So privileged. Now, Vicky has asked a question. Thank you very much for those quick fire questions, by the way, Jim. They weren't too bad. Were welcome. Uh, and um, yeah, Vicky's also a really um, in good question here. I think it leads on quite well. Is it worthwhile attending foraging courses and obviously interested in any North Wales, please? Like, Jim, so, um, you know, tell us about, you know, if people want to get more into foraging, maybe they want to go foraging with yourself. What's the what's the best way they can do that? How can they get in touch? There's, yeah, there, there's a lot of foraging companies now in the uh, in the UK. That, and there's some really good certified ones that have been around for many years. And they're, you know, Institute of Outdoor Learning. And I've worked with these, some of these people. And my expertise comes in the stories behind the flowers and the identifying 
and that side of things. So if you came out with me, you'd you wouldn't get to forage as such. I don't really run foraging, but I do the ID courses. It's as Dave Watson said. He said it's the icing on the on the cake with bushcraft. He said it's it's the stories behind all these trees and these plants that's often missing. So technical skills, if you want to forage, there's lots of really great people in the country. Mm. But I've got a way of I'm trying to make it memorable so you can identify things accurately, and that's my that's my approach to it. Yeah. But we we do try things when when we're out. But I've run the odd foraging course, but not not that many. So this is this is Jim's website, uh, natureswork.co.uk. Um, I think it's you know fascinating, obviously, hearing the stories behind the plants as well. I think that really brings them to life. Um, and Jim was just talking a bit about his book. So um, oh, oh, there we go. What a beautiful book. <laughs> and um, you understand your work. So you're working on a second edition. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, the publishers um, have sold out which is okay. fantastic because we've been doing lockdown. So they want to, to um, put a second edition out. So I've been working on some editions for it and it will be, that will be out. I've still got a dozen copies left of that book, but the new edition will be out. We're hoping for the summer season. So it's got flowers, the geology, which is fundamental to where you find the flowers, but also there'll be 24 walks in the book as well. So they cover right across the Alps in different lengths and but it's just to give the essence of of where and the different parts of the alps you can visit and walk and enjoy and see different things that's you know and it brings it brings the whole place to life and um i was going to mention one more thing as well you you sell see i'm, I'm a big fan oh, you got the yeah. card. so these are great so you know if if anyone wants to know more about uh foraging or the plants and the environment they're living in and i think it's so important to get more in touch with wild which is why we run the wild um it's it's a great way of unplugging getting connected to nature and um kind of de-stressing as well but these these are really good and if you want to, if you've got kids or you've got people who want to learn more about kind of that environment then uh, jim sells these playing cards i think quite unique really um on yeah um, there's a, so and i've got trump cards as well if you've got kids brill so um yeah there's a whole variety it's just you know they've got facts and information and id and just like they're proper playing cards as well so absolutely yeah, an evening in the hut. yeah um last we've got a request another question online this one from jason i think it's actually one of our regular run the world is so does jim have any tips on how to safely drink water from the mountain which I know is not quite exactly in line with what we're saying, um, but I know we, we, we look at this stuff quite regularly. Yeah, there are springs. I had a South African client once, and he said where he lives near is it the Drakensberg, he said if it's gone over seven, if the water's rolled over seven stones, you would drink it. It's, it's been cleaned and purified over seven stones. But it's that idea that it's been filtered. Yes. So just check the source <laughs> and always go upstream as far as you can. But I, I, I drink stream water regularly in the mountains. Yeah, and look at you. And there's springs everywhere, so, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I heard something like 50 metres. So 50 metres mm. of free-flowing water is probably enough to filter out most things. Yeah, but it's still, rocky. Yeah, exactly, rocky. You've got to look up look upstream because if there's like a, a dead sheep or, well, dead anything really, yeah. that's something you've got to be a little bit careful of. But, yeah, you're going to get quite sick. Absolutely. I know in the Alps, I, I'll always be sort of, you know, in the Alps, for example, and Jason you might be thinking about this, if you're going to go out to the Alps and do some, you know, running around there, you know, look at where the stream is traveling down. Has it traveled through another footpath above you on a zigzag? You know, so have people walked through that or, you yeah. know, are there, are there cattle grazing somewhere around above you or are you above everything? You know, so I think there's a context as well, isn't there? Just generally where you are on the hillside almost, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be drinking a stream that's necessarily coming directly down from the Snowden cafe, but you know, oh, if you're, if but you're no Snowden, even on Snowden, there's some wonderful springs you can drink from just right yeah. on the side of the path. So it's just being spot. careful. It's about being careful. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's. I think. I think probably people are more cautious than they need to be in reality. But, but uh, um, or, you know, when it comes to drinking spring, people think it's like, oh, it's you know, you'll always get sick. But actually, 
it's it's normally pretty good. So, um, well, I, we come to that the end of the end of the session, um, and I just want to thank you so much, Jim. It's always a pleasure well, to chat to you, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting out on some expeditions uh, this summer in the Alps with you. And yeah. um, and obviously, you know, thank you to everyone that was watching this evening, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you're watching it back as well, we really hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions uh, about um, about what we discussed this evening, do drop us a line. Drop uh, you can also drop Jim, Jim a line as well, as we kind of mentioned. So his uh, that's his website. And for those that are interested in uh, trail running trips, then that's us. So uh, we've got lots of trips going on in the Chilterns. And like I say, if we see any plants that can be forage, we'll point them out to you, but not necessarily eat them. And um, and all day with the Alps later this year. So um, thank you again for your time and. Uh, yeah, lovely to see you, Jim, and and hope all goes well um, with your with your spring and your season. Um, in, yeah, likewise. Uh, and everyone, just have a go. Just try try a little bit. You know, just absolutely, absolutely. All right, take care, everyone. Good night. Cheers, Sai. Thanks. Bye. Bye.